Good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, Lunch and Learn on Cone of Uncertainty, History, Empirical Foundation and Updates. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I thought I'd get started with uh, an introduction. Um, uh, my name is Steve McConnell. Uh, I'm probably best known as the author of Code Complete and uh, recently More Effective Agile. Um, for purposes of today, I think I'm really playing the role of CEO of Construct Software. And uh, that has to do with the fact that we're offering these complimentary lunch and learns during this uh, somewhat difficult and challenging period. Uh, in 2009, we had a program that we called the SPEAR program, which offered uh, uh, public seminars and software development to uh, laid off software workers during the recession. Uh, we thought that uh, this time around uh, offering a virtual lunch and learn program would be uh, an appropriate thing to do and maybe helpful to give people a chance to do something a little different uh, while uh, so many people are working from home. Um, our aspiration for this is that we create a community for software professionals who are working from home. Ideally, we'd love to have teams taking this training and uh, and uh, discussing what, what you hear during the lunch and learns uh, after the event itself. Uh, if uh, we can get some good discussion started uh, while people are working at home, then I think that'll be a good thing. So please uh, share the information about the Lunch and Learns with your friends, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the session. Um, let's see. So uh, again, thanks for joining me. Um, feel free to type in questions throughout the presentation. Uh, when you see me glance over like this, uh, that's because I'm looking at the questions. Uh, and if I see questions that come up uh, as we go that look good, then I will uh, I will answer them as we go. Uh, we'll probably look at them mostly at the end. Um, and the one thing we found is that we get some questions about people who think the presentation is frozen. That's mostly due to hitting the space bar. So please uh, avoid hitting the space bar. Uh, if it does freeze, just hit the space bar again. You'll be able to start again. I think uh, it's been an interesting time for a lot of us to get accustomed to lots of different uh, uh, virtual uh, uh, communication technologies. So that's the way this one works. Uh, so let's dive into the topic then. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is go through an introduction to the cone of uncertainty. I'm kind of assuming you're already familiar with the cone, so I'm not really going to spend a huge amount of time on that. I really want to spend most of the time talking about the history of the cone, uh, the empirical foundations of the cone, and then give some updates to the empirical foundations uh, of the cone. Uh, so let's then turn to that introduction to the cone of uncertainty. Uh, and uh, really the cone is about uncertainty in software projects. It's also about how uncertainty affects predictability, um, which is to say estimation. Uh, but it's not only about limits in estimation. It's, al it's also significantly about the uncertainty that's inherent in the pro projects themselves. Uh, this topic is primarily of, inter uh, of interest to projects and organizations that care about predictability. Um, if you don't care much about predictability, if your mission is just deliver whatever's most useful in the time allotted and nobody really cares what that's going to be until the end, then this is probably not a super interesting topic for you. If you uh, do care about predictability, if your organization kind of wants to know what they're going to get for the amount of money they're spending, uh, then this is, uh, this is a good topic, an important topic. So I want to start by talking about just some sources of uncertainty so that we all have kind of a shared understanding of all the places that uncertainty can come from on projects. Um, and there really are at least a couple different kinds of uncertainty. The one kind is what I would call unknowns. That is, we don't know what we're talking about. It's knowable. We just don't, don't know it yet. So these are unknowns. You might think of them as knowable unknowns. Um, and there's also just variability in project outcomes. And that's something that it's not possible to know. They're just things that happen. Uh, and the cone of uncertainty is really about both variability and uh, the knowable unknowns. Uh, and so, and, and I also say that these two interplay and there's not a bright line between the two. A lot of times there's overlap and you'll see what I mean as we get into some specifics. So uh, examples would include product concept. Uh, what in general are we trying to build in this release? Uh, and uh, clearly that's knowable, but that's subject to some variability as well as people come in and, and influence that decision. Um, specific features, how many are there? What are they? Are we doing the elaborate version or the simple version? Uh, is another source of uncertainty. Um, details of specific uncertainty, or rather of specific features, uh, those can shape up differently. Um, acceptability to the customer of proposed technical solutions or what is the range of solutions that might be acceptable and you know do you do you actually talk to the right customer in the first place 
you get buy-in from somebody you think is representative and then you put it out to a broader group and it turns out not to be representative, that's another source of uncertainty. Uh, and then there are solutions to known areas of questionable technical feasibility. In other words, at the outset, we know that there are certain areas that could be challenging and we know that we're going to have to do some investigation. Uh, and so those are kind of fall into the category of known unknowns. Uh, but there are additional technical areas of challenge where maybe at the outset we don't actually anticipate challenges in those areas. We just encounter them as we go. And so that would fall really into the category of unknown unknowns. Um, uh, and then we have this whole idea of how how uh, effective is our design and we have research that says different uh, designers presented with the same problem specification will come up with designs that vary by a factor of 10 uh, in the code volume required to implement those designs. So do you happen to come up with a 1x code volume solution or do you end up with something closer to the 10x code volume solution or maybe something somewhere in the middle? Uh, you know, that's going to affect, uh, put some variability into your project as well. Um, and then, of course, individual and team productivities. We've got on the order of 10x uh, variation in the productivity of indiv individuals. But we've also got on the order of 10x variability in the productivity that have been observed for teams. And so we've really got to pay attention or that that's an additional source of uncertainty as well. Uh, there are variabilities in how quickly we can staff up a project. Some organizations do that quickly. Some organizations are uh, much slower. Um, anyway, the cumulative effect of all these sources of uncertainty, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but it gives you an idea of the various ways that uncertainty can come into a project. Uh, the cumulative effect of all these is something I've called the cone of uncertainty. And the cone basically looks something like this, where uh, in the early days of a project, we've got a lot of uncertainty uh, about how the project might turn out. Sometimes this is presented as though it's uncertainty in the estimates. It certainly plays into the estimates, but really this is uncertainty in the project itself. All these sources of variability uh, come into play and they really are variability about decisions we haven't made yet about how the project is gonna turn out. And as we work our way through the project, the cone can narrow, it doesn't necessarily narrow, uh, but it can if we do our job right. And our job is really attacking those sources of uncertainty so that the cone can narrow over time. And the implication for estimation is that out here in the wide part of the cone, we can't have very good visibility into what the overall uh, outcome of the project is going to be. We have to make a bunch of decisions. By the time we make a lot of those decisions, uh, then we can have better visibility. Um, so um, just to uh, maybe I should clean up this, <laughs> uh, clean this up a little bit. Um, so let's just go through some um some of the the labels on this the initial product definition is the first milestone these are pretty traditional waterfallish milestones second one is approved product definition third one is requirement specification and the fourth one is what i'll call product design specifications that's basically like requirements plus the user experience um, and then we get to detailed design which i think is really not the way most teams work these days but um, so I think the significant milestone is this one here, the product design specification, because that's where we get the big narrowing. And then eventually we get to product complete. The vertical axis here is project scope, and that can be effort or size or features. These are all more or less interchangeable uh, from an estimation point of view. And the variability here is quite large. It ranges from a low of 0.25x, and that's all relative to the eventual outcome. So, so we could end up thinking the project is a quarter of its eventual size early on, or we could end up thinking that it's four times its eventual size early on. Um, and all that collectively gives us a 16x approximately variability um, early in the project. And then uh, the way I've drawn this chart is as if all these milestones are equally spaced in time. And the cone was originally drawn that way. Uh, mostly, I think, for aesthetic reasons. I think this ends up being pretty misleading in terms of uh, when these milestones occur on a well-run project. On a well-run project, these milestones are strongly front-loaded. Um, and so instead of having product design here, which looks like it's more than halfway through the project, we actually get to product design here, which is roughly 30% of the way into the project. I think the the older way of drawing the cone makes it look like it takes forever for the cone to narrow. Uh, this depiction based on calendar time makes it pretty clear that 
in fairly short order, we can reduce that variability from about 16x to about 1.5x. And this is really kind of the key point in terms of being able to make reasonable commitments and so on uh, to our projects. Um, so that's the, the general background on the cone. There's a lot more to it. Uh, you know, the key things that uh, people get wrong, I think the biggest thing is that thinking that it's a guarantee of improved accuracy and it's not. It's a prospect of improved accuracy if you successfully attack uh, the variability. A lot of projects don't. Um, the other thing I think is worth pointing out is that on agile projects, we've got a lot of variability and requirements. Um, this part of the cone is not super relevant to agile projects. It changes, um, our mission kind of changes at this point to doing the most useful thing in the time allotted. This part of the cone early is actually about the same on agile projects as it is on waterfall projects in that uh, up to this point, we haven't necessarily done a whole lot that's specifically agile typically. Uh, it kind of comes down to what our approach is to the requirements. And if we're doing requirements in a very iterative way, then we're not really going to be able to take advantage of the cone at all because that's saying predictability is not our primary concern. We're actually favoring flexibility. If we do care about predictability, then we're going to have to shift our requirements approach. Anyway, there are a lot of ins and outs of that. That's a topic for another day. Um, today, I want to get into the main topic, which is the history of the cone and the empirical foundations. And uh, for those of you who are joining us uh, as we go, uh, please feel free to type questions into the chat and, uh, uh, and uh, we'll take a look at those as we go. So let's dive into the history of the cone. Um, so the cone started out as uh, something called the funnel curve. Um, and this was published by Barry Boehm in his 1981 book, Software Engineering Economics. Um, Boehm called it the funnel curve. Uh, the reason I believe Boehm called it the funnel curve is that Dick, Dick Stetsky in his book on software estimation says that Boehm called it the funnel curve. I've never been able to find an actual reference to the phrase funnel curve in that 1981 book, uh, but um, um, I believe that that's where this all started. Uh, so in the original funnel curve from software engineering economics, it looked like this, where we've got the 4x to 0.25x variability. We've got the shape of the cone as described. We've got these equally spaced milestones shown on this axis. So a lot of it looks a lot like uh, what we're talking about today with some pretty important refinements, I think, in terms especially of the way this uh, the x-axis or horizontal axis is drawn. Um, so the background on the 1981 funnel curve was this was essentially notional based on BAME's judgment. There wasn't really empirical data supporting this, at least not directly factored into the cone. I think BAME had a ton of experience in software estimation, so his judgment turns out to have been pretty darn good, uh, but there wasn't data supporting that original version of the cone. Uh, the focus in this version of the cone was really about estimation and estimation accuracy. There wasn't really a lot of commentary at that point about why there was why the estimates varied by that much. The notion that variability is a big deal and the cone is really about variability hadn't come in yet. Um, so the next version of the cone uh, is what I'm going to call the NASA Software Engineering Lab cone. They didn't refer to it as the cone either, but it's presented in a variety of NASA Software Engineering Lab documents in the around 1990. Uh, and the basic cone looks like this, where um, the cone part is shown by the gray shaded area in the diagram. And uh, and then we've got uh, uh, a pretty interesting uh, dynamic here where the cone grows over time. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so this was just another version of, of uh, some work in estimation, again, focusing on estimation, that uh, acknowledged the notion that there's a lot of variability early in the project. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, these uh, milestones shown in the NASA cone because this is different than the cone that I mostly am going to be presenting to you. Um, and so there were there were various presentations of this information in various documents. And again, we'll we'll circle back to this a little bit later on in the talk. Uh, so then the funnel curve got updated in Kokomo 2, uh, second version of Kokomo. Uh, papers on this started to be published around uh, 1995. And in the in Kokomo 2, um, we started to see some data points showing up on the on the curve. 
And uh, so that are those are these points here. Uh, the axes stayed the same, running from 4x to 0.25x. The labels down here toward the bottom, uh, I've actually updated the labels to, um, no, let's see. I've updated some of these labels on the bottom, uh, but, the, but the key point here is that some data points started showing up. Um, and it's interesting that the data points showed up and the values of the axis ended up not really changing as a result of the data points. But as you can see, the data points are actually over a pretty narrow part of the cone. There's nothing in this area of the cone. In the really wide part, there's nothing in this area of the cone either. Um, so we'll get we'll talk again more about these empirical data points when I get to the empirical part of the talk as opposed to the history part. Then uh, in my book, Rapid Development, I published an updated version of the cone in 1996. Um, and there were a couple of updates here. One is I, I, la I labeled the Y axis scope because um, I wanted to indicate it that it wasn't just cost. It could be a cost, it could be effort or it could be features. Again, these are pretty much interchangeable for software uh, estimation purposes. And then I added a secondary y-axis on the right side of the diagram uh, for schedule, uh, where the numbers on the right side of the axis were different. Um, I didn't name the curve at this point. It didn't have a name other than some people knew Bayme called it the funnel curve. Um, so you can see over here, I've got the schedule uh, numbers, and you can also see the schedule numbers are not the same at all as the scope numbers. Uh, and that turned out to be kind of problematic. I think the numbers on the schedule axis were the result of a pretty technical estimation issue, namely that uh, as you get into bigger project estimates, uh, schedule is a cube root function of effort in certain circumstances. And I think if you're looking at really big projects, uh, it's a pretty safe uh, first order approximation, but there are a lot of exceptions. And when you get into smaller projects, there really are a lot of exceptions. In fact, there are so many exceptions, I think that schedule axis has been pretty confusing. From time to time, I'll see versions of the cone published on the web where people have taken the right axis, which is schedule, and moved it to the left. Uh, that is to say, the numbers moved to the left. It's completely not valid to do that, but I've seen examples of the cone that have had that, had that done to it. I've also seen very um, primitive descriptions of schedule as though the schedule just is guaranteed to be in that range regardless of what else happens it's not the case at all um it there really are are specific circumstances that cause that y-axis uh the secondary y-axis to be valid and i think in general there are so many exceptions that i actually wish i had not included that because i think it's a pretty uh esoteric uh, estimation topic uh pretty confusing to people who aren't really into the up to their eyeballs in estimation so uh in hindsight i wish i'd omitted it but anyway that version of the cone was out there um so then in software project survival guide um uh i i introduced the term cone of uncertainty and that was in 1998 uh according to wikipedia i know some people have seen that cone of uncertainty phrase applied to hurricane forecasting uh, according to Wikipedia, hurricane forecasting's use of that term was based on software's use. Um, but other than the name, uh, the version of the cone in Software Project Survival Guide was the same as the version in Rapid Development. Uh, so then uh, we come to my 2006 book, Software Estimation Demystifying the Black Art. Um, and uh, that book was published in 2006, so that's 10 years after Rapid Development. Uh, and this was the first time that calendar time version of the cone had been published. Everything up to that point had been the equally spaced milestones, but this was the first time anybody published the actual calendar time with the milestones, milestones spaced as they occur in time rather than equally spaced for aesthetic reasons. I had been teaching the calendar time version of that cone for a long time in classes for constructs, but that was the first time it showed up in print. Uh, so um that's really a brief tour through the history of the cone of uncertainty um and uh, to summarize that a little bit i'd say the cone started as a notional concept uh called the funnel curve the funnel curve was later validated with a small data set uh and then eventually i renamed the cone or the curve the cone of uncertainty um, which is what it is uh, widely known as today <clears throat> So 
So let's then talk to uh, maybe the most interesting part of the talk, the empirical foundations for the cone. Um, so the initial versions of the cone, as I said, BAME's 1981 funnel curve um, was notional, not based on empirical data. So we've covered that topic. Um, the funnel curve that came out in 2000, well, the official publication of Kokomo 2 was in 2000 and papers started showing up earlier than that, had a couple of uh, sets of data points. And interesting thing about these data points is that they are not definitely not equal. This set of data points on the left side uh, are from completed projects. So those I would consider to be actual data points in terms of variability. The set of data points on the right are from a set of proposal time estimates. So whereas these are normalized on the basis of completed projects, meaning we know how the project turned out, so we can go ahead and orient these points um, over here based on how the project actually turned out. The second set of points is from a set of estimates. So the spread in the estimates I think is valid and we can pay attention to that, but we don't really know where the project would have turned out. We don't know if the project ended up exactly in the middle of the range of estimates or if it ended up on the top end or if it ended up on the low end. Um, and so I think that calls the second set of estimates into question. So not not we don't doesn't call the range into question, but it calls positioning on the graph into question. So they're presented as though they're in the middle, but we don't really know since they're not based on completed project data whether they're really on the high end or whether they're really on the low end. So we we just don't know. Um, and so what we see from experience is that we have a really strong systemic tendency toward underestimation. People sometimes talk about estimation error as though it's a neutral phenomenon where sometimes we overestimate, sometimes we underestimate, we just can't seem to get it right. Experience says that's not the case. Experience says that we have a very strong error tendency on the underestimation side. And so when we look at that set of points, I think it's really questionable that they're evenly distributed around the final answer. I think it's very likely that those points represent um, underestimation rather than overestimation. We'll get to that more in a minute. Uh, so the next empirical foundation was really the NASA Software Engineering Lab cone, uh, really coming out kind of in the same era as the Kokomo 2 cone. Um, there was lots of research done at NASA in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, they published as uh, they publish factors based on data, I believe as early as 1984, so a long time ago. Um, and their data was published in numeric form. I, I've converted their data into a visual format. Um, and uh, what their, what their uh, information said is that, unlike the cone that I've drawn, it starts out here at feasibility stage, their cone actually starts here at the requirement spec phase. And interestingly enough, um, this vertical axis is not called uh, scope, it's called uncertainty in size, uh, or rather it's not called cost, it's called uncertainty in size. I think that's a good label. Uh, it's a little clearer that it's about scope rather than just about cost. Um, and then the milestones here are pretty interesting as well, where we start actually at requirements analysis, uh, and uh, that's not something that's in the uh, other version of the code, and then we get into preliminary design and detailed design, and those are, are different as well, and then system test. And the interesting thing here is uh, this variability uh, that they, they uh, show at requirement spec time is quite a bit higher than the variability shown in other versions of the cone. So I think that's pretty interesting too, is that they're seeing a lot more variability um, at that point in time than other versions of the cone do. Um, and then this whole area to the left is just a big unknown in the NASA version of the cone. Uh, they don't really make any big statements about this and you can interpret it a lot of different ways. Uh, uh, and I guess I would interpret it as, say, as them saying, look, there's so much variability here. We're not really gonna try to do anything in the areas that have even higher variability than that. I, I'm just speculating that that's not something that I think they, uh, they definitely uh, said that's just my interpretation. Uh, so anyway, so this slide just summarizes uh, summarizes what I just talked through. I would say they don't publish the source of the data. Uh, so it's they publish a table, but they don't really go into a lot of detail about where the data is, is from. Uh, 
so that's really it in terms of empirical support for the cone. Uh, historically, not a huge amount has been published. Some has been published, not a lot. Um, my company has been talking about the cone of uncertainty for a long, long time. We've worked with quite a few companies in uh, improving their estimation practices over the years. And so we've had the opportunity to look at a bunch of data sets from different companies and see uh, what their cones look like. Uh, and so the updated cone that I'm going to present to you is based on estimates versus actuals for our clients. That is, uh, we are including data from estimates, but all of these estimates are also uh, normalized or rationalized by knowing what the actuals for the projects were. So unlike that uh, uh, Kokomo 2 version of the cone where we had a set of proposal time estimates, but we didn't know how the projects turned out. All the data I'm going to show you is based on projects where we did know how the project turned out. And then we were able to normalize that result to 1.0 and go back and look at the estimates that have been prepared for those projects earlier and calculate a cone based on that. Uh, overall, the, the, the cone I'm going to show you is based on about 350 estimates from five companies. You know, overall, I would consider this to be a fairly small data set, but it certainly contains a lot more data than the Kokomo 2 version of the cone did. Uh, so I think this is a, you know, is a certainly enough to give us some a little bit of confidence that what we're seeing is a real phenomenon. Uh, the industries that are included in our version of the cone include retail, uh, multiple retail organizations, we have multiple IT organizations, uh, multiple oil and gas organizations, and uh, aerospace organization. Um, I've also included in the data set the 15 data points from BAME that were based on project actuals. I did not include the points that were based on uh, the proposal time estimates. Uh, so I have to say that the companies varied in their estimation maturity. Some were somewhat sophisticated, some were really not sophisticated in their approach to estimation. So in this case, some of the error is in fact attributable to underlying project variability, which is the main thing I've emphasized in the talk today. Uh, some of the error has to be attributed to poor estimation though. So we've really got a combination. I think it's impossible to say how much of the error comes from uh, which source they are they are both in play here uh, in order to make the graph comprehensible it does not show all of the outlying data points um, some of the data points are really extreme and so this really peels off the middle 90 percent of the data points uh, i'll also say that uh, <laughs> to add to the confusion what i talked about with that secondary y-axis where i'd schedule on one axis and effort on the other axis uh, the companies we've worked with have not been clear about whether they're estimating cost or effort or schedule. In some cases, they just assume they're all the same. Uh, sometimes there are constraints mixed into the data, like uh, the, the y-axis for effort in, in the rapid development version of the cone assumes that staffing can vary on an unconstrained basis as needed which is how you get to that cube root function. But a lot of companies staffing obviously cannot vary on an unconstrained basis. Staffing is in fact constrained, constrained in which case the relationship between the effort and the schedule ends up becoming a much more linear relationship than the cube root function. Uh, and so anyway, this data set ends up mixing cost, effort and schedule. And I think that's OK because of the circumstances under which schedule data gets mixed in there. Uh, so let's take a look at the format. Uh, the format I've got here is uh, the, the double blue line is the median estimate or the average. Uh, the top line represents the 95th percentile estimate. So I'm excluding the top 5% from the results. Uh, in some, some cases, because you'll see, even when we exclude the top 5%, we still get some extreme numbers, uh, but the, the numbers that are excluded are even more extreme. Uh, and then I also exclude the bottom 5%, uh, and those can be pretty extreme as well. So we've got a cone that pulls out the middle 90% of the range. So it goes from 5th percentile to 95th percentile. Uh, and then the scale, uh, the, the vertical scale on the cone is an error measure called that I've called signed balanced relative error. Um, I could give another talk on how to do error measurement with estimation. Uh, the error measure that is typically used uh, has been something called relative error, and there are a bunch of issues related to 
uh, anomalies that come up when we use relative error. That's again the subject for a different talk. Uh, but I've settled on this for purposes of drawing a cone anyway. I've settled on this error measure called signed BRE or signed balanced relative error as uh, the most representative, uh, most intuitive error measure uh, for this purpose. Um, so uh, anyway, so this this is what the updated cone would look like if it matched the notional industry average data cone. Uh, this is actually not this nice symmetrical even cone is not what the updated cone based on our empirical data looks like. Um, so here are the data points. Uh, this is the 300-ish uh, data points that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and as you look at the data points, you can see uh, they're not all clustered around the uh, some symmetrical axis of 1.0 or of a 0% error. Uh, what we find is that uh, if we did have uh, some sort of uh, symmetrical uh, estimation error or variability creeping in, the graph would look like this. It's not what it looks like. Uh, what it looks like instead is uh, like this. And uh, um, and uh, so you can see very, very asymmetrical. And I think some pretty interesting uh, implications here. Um, so let's take a look at some implications of this. Uh, so I've cleaned up the graph a little bit here. I've left off the data points now and just shown the, the uh, fifth percentile line, the 95th percentile line, and the median line. Um, so it's interesting, I think, early in the project, the median estimate is an underestimate. And so I don't think that should be a big surprise to anybody who's participated in software project estimates. We know about that systemic tendency toward underestimation. Uh, but there it is confirmed in the data. The median estimate is an underestimate. Um, overestimation is a modest phenomenon, at least compared to underestimation. So our biggest overestimate is around 250%, whereas our biggest underestimate is minus 700%. So that's quite a difference between the error tendency on the overestimation side versus underestimation side. Um, and the early underestimates can be quite extreme. You know, as I said, starting out here at minus 700% in the early, the widest part of the cone, but narrowing pretty quickly. Um, once we get about a third of the way into the project, overestimation is basically doesn't happen. Uh, we end up having sustained underestimation really for the, the bulk of the project. The median starts out being uh, pretty significant underestimation on the graph. It doesn't look that significant, but if you look at it, we start out underestimating by almost 100%, which is we're about a factor of two low. So given the scale of the graph, it doesn't that doesn't seem that dramatic, but it actually is pretty dramatic. And even once we're 10 percent of the way into the project, we're still underestimating by more than 50%. Once we get 20% in, then we're you know the median underestimate is more modest. But then the extremes are still, you know, the fifth percentile underestimate is minus 300%. So that's a pretty big underestimate. Um, so in terms of um, uh, other observations about the uh, this uh, version of the cone based on constructs as uh, empirical data, uh, I'll make a few more observations. One is. In the really early days of the cone, we've got about a 20x variability between the high and the low estimate. Um, and uh, as we get into a little bit further into the cone, it's 18x, a little bit further uh, into the cone, it's 10x. By the time we get about 35% of the way into the cone, we're down to 2.5x. So we do in fact see quite a dramatic shrinking of variability from 21x down to 2.5x. And that's even in this context where we have a mixture of underlying variability added to estimation error on top of that because we did have some organizations that were just not that good at estimating. So even in that context, we see a pretty dramatic narrowing of the cone. Now 2.5x is still quite a bit of variability. I mean, for predictability purposes, we still don't have great predictability at that level. And from my point of view, because although I think the cone is interesting in terms of dy project dynamics and the discussion of variability is interesting, the prospect it holds out for improved estimation accuracy is we can tighten this range up um, beyond this. We can't make it perfect, but we can tighten it up quite a bit 
through better estimation practices. And so I think that's worth noting that um, this is a lot better than this, but we can make it better still if we actually know what we're doing on the estimation side. Uh, anyway, and then we get halfway into the project. Now we're down to 1.4x uh, and uh, and then we kind of continue all the way through. And it's interesting that the cone never, uh, you know, does not close to, to 1.0x, meaning no variability. Even by the time we're 90% of the way into the project, we've still got some amount of variability. Uh, but again, I think that speaks to um, really a lack of expertise in really combination of estimation and then also uh, project control in the later stages of the project. But um, with good estimation project control, we can tighten this number up a lot. Uh, and then we can tighten these numbers up so that these are effectively 1.0 if we're at this point exerting some combination of control along with our estimation. Um, so to clean up the version of the cone, and this would be like the version that I would clean up for sake of publishing this, we go from plus 100 to minus 700. If you look at the, the graph, it's not exactly 100, but I'm using round numbers just, well, in part because even with 350 data points, I think these are approximations. Uh, and then interestingly enough, we go up, our overestimate increases as we get into the project a little bit. Underestimation is decreasing the magnitude is decreasing all the way, the overestimation actually goes up quite a bit uh, before it starts to come back down. And then by the time we get to about a third of the way into the project, we're effectively at zero overestimation, but we're still doing minus 150 on the underestimation side. And these are percentages. Um, and then we still have that systemic tendency toward underestimation for the rest of the project. Uh, I think this curve is actually kind of a, uh, although this, this is our data with this asymmetric cone, this asymmetric cone was also shown in the NASA data where um, we have uh, the cone that in their case accounts for growth in requirements is what they say. Um, uh, so I think it's interesting that we saw con we've seen confirmation of that phenomenon for a really long time. Um, and then I think the psychology of the asymmetry of the cone is pretty interesting because I think if you look at the empirical cone, it actually looks like an example of what Gartner has called the hype cycle. So if you look at the hype cycle and we start with pessimism and optimism, we start out basically and the, 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 the shape of the cone kind of goes like this shown by the blue line where early on we have some technology trigger. So that's like we want to do this project. Let's create an estimate for it. We start out being very optimistic and in the hype cycle that's called the peak of inflated expectations. Uh, then reality sets in and we realize, OK, this is going to be more difficult than we thought. And that's what the hype cycle calls the trough of disillusionment. Uh, and then we get into the point where we get a little bit more balanced view and then the real work begins. And that's what the hype cycle calls the slope of enlightenment. So I think it's kind of interesting. We see this whole uh, uh, hype cycle played out project after project after project uh, in the shape of the cone of uncertainty. So uh, to summarize on uh, the updated cone, uh, I think BAME's early 16x, 16x variation is roughly true. Uh, we see in our version of the cone that we've got a 21x variation and the calculation is shown there on the slide uh, if you're interested. Uh, but I think it's, you know, I think BAME's notional view from a really long time ago turned out to be pretty close to what we see in our data. Uh, I think er, we saw that the early estimates tend to significantly underestimate, uh, both in terms of the extremes, but also in terms of the, me the median. Uh, we see that the degree of underestimation is much more significant than the degree of overestimation really uh, uh, throughout, or except for one, one point uh, here. Uh, and then we see a dramatic narrowing occurs about one third of the way through uh, to about 2.5x. And then, as I said, that can be improved through the use of better estimation practices. Um, and there's virtually no tendency to overestimate after the project's midpoint. So we just don't see overestimates after we get um, uh, partway through the project, halfway through the project. Uh, underestimation remains a significant phenomenon, I would say you know, until somewhere in here maybe. Um, you, you can say whether you think this matters as a significant underestimate or not, but it clearly is, you know, very significant, at least the first half of the project. 
Uh, and then I would say uh, again that the graph doesn't really show what's possible if we have really good uh, estimation practices in play. We're still going to have a cone of uncertainty with really good estimation practices in play, but we'll get one where the source of the uncertainty is more from the underlying variability in the project and less from uh, ineffective estimation practices. Uh, so that kind of brings us to our, our close on today's uh, session. Uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at the schedule for more lunch and learns at constructs.com slash lunch. And uh, as I said at the beginning of the talk, please uh, share this with your friends. Uh, and if you're interested in this topic or other, other uh, lectures like this, um, check out our lecture series at ondemand.constructs.com. Uh, I've got a series called Understanding Software Projects that goes into a lot of detail about uncertainty. The cone of uncertainty is a, a focus of those, and there are other lectures, additional lectures on the cone. Um, I also talk about the important role of uh, human variation uh, defects and size, and I think those are critical topics, so you can check those out. And uh, I am not seeing any questions, so I'm not sure uh, if, uh, oh, here we do. Okay, I guess I am seeing some questions. Okay, so I was just looking at the wrong screen. So we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, so first question, um, uh, first question, is the updated cone skewed by real data where overestimation is much more common than underestimation? Plan to be posted in Constructs' as online discussion of the cone. So yeah, we've got a white paper online on the cone of uncertainty. Um, that is a really good question. We have not updated that white paper to show this empirical version of the cone. Uh, I think that would be a good idea. That white paper gets downloaded quite a bit, so uh, we probably should um, do that. So thanks for pointing that out. All right, um, next question is um, just a comment on the phrases. Who do you brainstorm with to come up with these phrases? Great understanding summary on the updated cone. Uh, I'm not really sure what phrases uh, you're referring to. If the phrase that we're talking about is the cone of uncertainty phrase, um, <laughs> that actually came from, oops, um, that actually came from my next door neighbor. Sorry, just. Um, stop the presentation let me turn that back on um let's see here okay looks like we're we're back in business on that um yeah so anyway um that phrase actually came from my next door neighbor who was reviewing the manuscript for software project survival guide and and uh and came up with the phrase cone of uncertainty. And um, when, I, when I started seeing it in hurricane forecasting, I wasn't sure if maybe he had gotten it from that. So I went and talked to him. I said, well, did you come up with this or did you hear about this somewhere else? And he said, no, it's just, it's a cone and it's uncertain. So it seemed obvious, cone of uncertainty. Um, and uh, let's see, it looks like the only other comment we've got is not a question, really enjoyed the talk. Appreciated the inverted overlay of the Gartner hype cycle graph. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. So I think that's it for today. I appreciate everybody showing up today. Uh, please check out the other talks and uh, love to have you back again. Have a good day.